Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for joining us for one of our talks today. I'm so excited today to be talking even more about the wonderful HBO show, The Nevers. We have Michelle Clapton, who's the costume designer on the show, and Gemma Jackson, who's the production designer. And the first thing I was really fascinated in by in terms of your process and, and how you approach this particular project is how you set the rules for yourself. Because obviously it's a period piece setting, but it's tied in with supernatural elements. So how strict did you want to be with certain pieces that really needed to have that specific authenticity to the time period versus where you allowed yourself a little bit more freedom to step outside of it for both of your roles? You go first, Gemma, because you started it really. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I think it's, there are a lot of questions, a lot of things to think about in what you just mm -hmm. asked. But I think fundamentally, one of the most important things <clears throat> about it is to, um, we created a world which we based in the Victorian era. And I think that the most important thing is when you're doing um, this sort of slightly futurist or sci-fi, all those various elements, is that you do not um, um, bow down to those elements. They happen, you create a very, very real world. And I think the reason that this partly works is because um, the world that we've got is kind of real and believable. And yet standing back and looking at it, sort of like watching the episodes, we've definitely created a world that is, is not like walking down to the East End of London. It has got its own special magic, but it didn't come from a conscious kind of, I'm going to create a really interesting world here. It came from, um, kind of looking at the demands of the show, thinking about what was happening, kind of, and, and we we kind of created a way of doing it, but it definitely was never thought to be like sort of out there, futuristic. It was kind of like as real within our own uh, our own kind of um, logistics, if you like. Mm. Yeah, and I think I agree. I mean, obviously, I always look at Gemma's sets for inspiration because they are created often before. So, well, the ideas are there before I often join. And so, again, I think Gemma, I always discuss palettes and how, my, how the people I dress or the characters I dress live within her sets. Um, and I agree, I absolutely didn't want to make like weird and wonderful steampunk costumes because you completely lose the direction then. And we try to really adhere quite strictly to the shapes and the silhouettes of the period. And also, you know, the characters, I mean, they're so diverse. You have the orphans that live in the orphanage, they're not gonna have it a lot of money or style, so we can actually be quite eclectic in how they put their costumes together and using a lot of sort of, I guess, ethnic ideas as well from being around the docks. And then you have the Lavinia characters who are sort of more spot on fashion. So there's so much room to move within the period that you don't have to invent things. It's just how our characters choose to wear them quite often. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think I agree with Gemma. It's really important not to try hard, too hard to make it different. And then slowly it sort of evolves. The script allows it to evolve. Um, and the things that penance make helps it evolve. So yes. it's the script, it's all led by the script. Yes, and it was an amazing, they are were all amazing scripts and they're very mm. they're fascinating characters. I mean, where they, who they all are, where they've all been, what they've all done. I mean, they, they, they tell you so much about what you've got to, to do, mm. you know, you've got to give them. And, and Michelle's quite right. We've, we've worked together before, as you know, so um, we, we know each other well, and actually I'd say trust each other pretty yeah. fundamentally, which is a lovely mm. way to mm. work with everybody. Don't you think, Michelle? I mean, uh, Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love it. I mean, right love down, right down to the case. We enjoy each other's creativity, don't we, I think? Exactly. And I mean, I love going to Gemma's office. I always feel like I know where I'm going then. And I mean, then I'll say, these are the colours of the costume. You go, these are the colours of the cakes. <laughs> and it's like... Wow, this Normally, really it well. works. We hard, very rarely have a like, oh my god moment. I mean, it's um, I know it's, it's funny, and, and we hadn't worked together for a little while. And, and you were saying, oh my god, I hope that magic hasn't gone, but then it is there. And as soon as you, yeah. I think it's because we both just love the characters and want to make where they live and who they are and what they say completely and utterly believable. And then you allow the character to exist and, and start traveling in this journey. I mean, for yeah, me anyway. Yeah. And then they can throw fireballs and you sort of yeah. believe them because it's yeah. real person, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it was fun. <laughs> And Gemma, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Penance's workshop space because the amount of minute detail in that, and it's also in terms of the scope of that location, it's a huge set that was constructed. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to just ask you about the journey and process in really breaking down a lot of internal elements of who she is as a character and then how you wanted to bring that into the, the physical location through so many intimate details. Right. 
Well, um, it's a diff- do you know, believe it or not, it's quite a hard one to answer because it sort of, again, it sort of grew really a little bit, sort of quite organic. This whole process on that film, that series, is actually <laughs> very organic. And um, Pennant is the most gorgeous character with his quite exceptional skills. Um, I think with it sort of the the scale of it kind of arose from the the demand of the script. She had to do molten, you know, molten metal. She had to have. We thought she ought to have somewhere where she could have a bit of a kip every now and again. She had a sort of office where her drawings were, which wasn't particularly used. She had to make all these extraordinary things. So she seriously needed some space for all that. She was going to create a car or two, you know. So um, we we kind of. What was really nice was that the um, actual orphanage courtyard was, it was a real location that we doctored and did things to, but it kind of presented a beautiful space that just worked perfectly for her, her workshop. So therefore that kind of told us what the size was and therefore we then built that back on our stage at Titan. Um, and I think it was really important to show everybody um, her extraordinary sort of capacity for working with electricity and inventing these extraordinary things. I mean, I love the fact she always sort of like, oh, you know, it's only a prototype, but she also is completely extraordinary. You know, we had people running around in those cars. I mean, that alone is a feat, I think, you know. Um, so I think I, I looked at a lot of the buildings and I love the kind of that thing of the lights, the, the kind of that having that, um, I don't know what's the, what there's a name for them, of course, it's gone right out of my head. But anyway, um, there's a lot of kind of uh, warehouses of that of the Victorian era and some of the kind of medical places have those lovely side lights that go down and that casts a lovely evening, you know, sort of the north light in her room so that it was always um, great for the DPs because I work quite a lot thinking about how people are going to bring light into a space. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can always see it or something dodgy when you think, poor old DP didn't have a hope because there's no way to get any light in there. So that was important. And that also, the light could then go through into her little private workspace. Um, and it was a living space. So I think, you know, she does a bit of rather too many times washing her armpits, I think. But at the same time, you know, she lives there. I don't think she's probably got, she's got a little cot up on the top. I suspect she very rarely makes it back to the dormitory. She says she doesn't sleep anyway. So... Um, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. And to, to the point of the fact that that's also where she lives, I think the orphanage does a really fantastic job at really poking into all these different corners and telling us different character details based on where each of their spaces are. So when you were constructing that space as a whole, how were you thinking about this wonderful amalgamation of characters and the ways that you wanted to put them into the location of the orphanage? Well, I think originally um, the, the orphanage... Uh, that's where they all ended up. And so at one point we thought it'd be great to have them all sort of bundled together. But then in the end, there were too many people other than that. So we've got a slightly kind of crazy situation where we've got the big dormitory in there, which is like, sort of, ah, you know, there's Primrose and all the rest of them. And then we started creating more spaces. So we've tried to try to make the feel, place feel quite transient and that there's always, um, you know, every nobody really gets the other than obviously Amalia, who's in a different league, but the rest of them, they don't sort of get the, the, the pleasure of a room to themselves. They've all got to have, I'm doing a whole lot more rooms at the moment for the new season. And there's very much the idea is that there's always two or three beds in a room, even if there's only one character, because the idea is you don't know who's going to arrive tonight, who's going to need a bed for the night. So the whole the whole place is kind of full of generosity, I think, and love towards all each other, one another. And, and huge sympathy and they feel really, really safe there, you know. So the only sort of um, poor old Amalia up there with all her wild troubles and imaginings, you know, but she's been given this little suite, which is rather special and beautiful and, and, and seriously a cut above the rest of them, you know. And Michelle, I wanted to ask you about the relationship between the costumes for Amalia and Penance, because, you know, you've beautifully constructed these costumes and given them very specific color palettes. When we look at Amalia, it's slightly darker hues of like browns and kind of maroons. And and then Penance has slightly lighter, more pastel shades. And so I wanted to ask about the way in which you constructed these very unique individual looks for them, but also really thought about the relationship of how they coexisted with each other and their costumes could represent that friendship. Yeah, I was very keen to keep their... um, their colour palettes, I wanted it to relate to the characters, but also, I guess with with Penance, there's such a softness, there's such a warmth and a loveliness and a rosiness to her. I mean, her complexion is just so beautiful and fresh and dewy. And I just wanted to put her in these sort of soft browns and, and um, blues and something which 
didn't dominate her. There's a gentleness to her in her sort of in her character. Whereas Amalia is much tougher and more strident, and we, we decided to go much more graphically, I guess, in her in her costume. So heavier fabrics, heavier sleeves. And so when you saw them together, you almost instantly got what each one was about. Um, and also I wanted, I guess it was something very, I wanted Amalia's um, silhouette to be very sharp and very of the time. I mean, she's about this person who A, dislikes this funny little podgy body she's sort of ended up in, she says, and she's trying to sort of work it and, and refine it and, and make it into something that she knows from before, into a, a leanness. So that was sort of the thoughts behind it. And then I loved this idea that we gave her the little scarf at the neck, which had a buckle, because again, I didn't want to do this sort of traditional high collar because it somehow was restricting, but there was something quite rakish about this collar that gave the illusion of the high collar without actually being that. Um, and also, I guess it's slightly more fashionable in a funny way, slightly more stiff, fits into her room. There's a sort of strength about her. With, I mean, I, with Kate Reed, who was one of the GOPs, and when we were filming, actually, um, Penance washing her armpits in, in Gemma's set, it was lovely to have these lovely soft sort of pieces um, hanging on the line that she could shoot through. Yeah. And that sort of was the essence of it. She's a bit sort of ramshackle, a bit soft and throwing together. So... Yeah, it was just looking at them and trying to sort of bring out their their characters in a visual sense that we know who they are even before we know who they are. I was also really interested in a lot of the functionality of the costumes because obviously when you're mm. looking at period pieces, it's very constrictive in a different way. Um, and yet you still went through the scripts and, and would go, okay, this character is going to go into water. They probably need to be wearing culottes. But also you did it in a way where it doesn't really call attention to the functionality of mm. costumes. Um, and so I was really fascinated in how you managed to achieve that. I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess with, um, yeah, the water work is always quite difficult. And it was like, luckily, as we'd read the script, we could see that, I always thought of buttonings and openings and practicality would be quite important to Amalia. So we did do these sort of side buttons, which are very much of the period, but that she could open. And we practiced that whole gesture of her trying to open and get out, which is really important. Um, but there are sometimes, you know, that Joss would write like, okay, she lifts up her skirt and there's a recording device underneath. And you'd go like, okay, so how do we do this? <laughs> so there were some quite mad moments. And I mean, we, yeah, it was sometimes quite hard to keep up and think, well, how are we gonna, how would she do this? And we always want as penance to actually be a little bit out of date. Even though when she goes to the party, um, Lavinia's party, she actually, although she looks really pretty and soft and gentle, it's actually a bit makeshift. It's from a slightly earlier period. And although everyone thinks she looks beautiful, as soon as she walks into that room, the people in the know and Lavinia's friend would go, oh, that's a bit dated, how sad. Yet she looks gorgeous and soft and delightful. and. But I just love that idea that, you know, the people who know, know that she's not very fashionable and is not very smart, even though she feels so pretty. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, that's what you just think perfect. about. Sorry? I was just saying, Augie completely falls for it, so. Of course, of course. Yeah. And and she is delightfully pretty. And he's not someone who worries about, you know, the size of someone's sleeve. So, but the people <laughs> there would notice. Um, and so, I get, yeah, I, and again, actually, I think when Amalia sort of goes underground and through the tunnels, we knew that we'd need culottes. The culottes were there at the time. It's like she would appropriate those into something which was functional with the straps, probably with the health of penance, to say, this is what I need. So that's, I think, when you have fun within the period. You don't design for this, you don't design something strange for the sake of it. You go, how would she achieve this within the period? She would take some, I don't know, some uh, culottes which were used for cycling and make them into something else. So it was, yeah, it's just working with, in what you can achieve, I think, at the time. I think it's very little that isn't that isn't actually of the period or, or prior period. Yeah. And obviously so much of the core of what the show is is focusing on and centralizing and celebrating female empowerment and, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of like that inner strength in the core of these characters. And so I wanted to ask you both about the way that that infiltrated a lot of the details for you, you know, down to a lot of aspects within the costume, looking at a more constrictive time, how you wanted to express that through their costumes. And then Gemma with the production design, you know, details like even when you were talking about the workshop earlier, you know, that's a great expression of it as well. And, and it was interested in what some of the other details tells where that you both pulled into to expressing that through your work well I think the thing about it that I have to say that was one of the huge attractions of the project at the beginning was that mm. I just um, obviously I had heard of Joss etc etc and um, Bernie Caulfield was an old friend but it, it was like 
when I read the script, I thought, oh my God, I think I've really got to do this. This is so good. I mean, everything about it, it was sharp and punchy. The women are none of that. They're all strong characters. And so you sort of immediately think, yeah, I think I've really got, so you start trying to create their world. And obviously the, one of the big worlds was the orphanage and everything. But I think more importantly, it's kind of like who they all are and how they all fit into it and um, what all their skills are. And of course that grows and grows through the whole series and you begin to see more about and the different characters come through. And I think there's a lot of kind of um, slightly more abstract things about it that I can talk about, which, you know, I think the support for one another is really beautiful mm -hmm. and it's not at all mushy or it's just very, um, uh, very positive all the time. And, um, um, and I think the, the way they sort of stand together and, I, you know, the death of Mary absolutely slays me when I, when I saw it <laughs> again. And, um, you know, the whole relationship with Frank is so moving and mm -hmm. we all know what, I guess she knows, but it's just so tender and there's so mm. much compassion in the whole script that mm. I think when you design these things, you, it's a really strange kind of, I don't know, me and Michelle probably do work in different ways, but sometimes colours just present themselves to you. You don't sort of sit there for hours going, oh, I wonder what I can do here. Somehow, when you read scripts like that, it really just sort of hits you and you'd kind mm. of just go off I mean, of course, you've got to sit down and make decisions and how big this is and how big that is. But there's a kind of um, underlying path that you're kind of following to, mm. which is your response to the original scripts and the original mm. kind of whole concept that becomes your kind of guideline. So in the end, when someone says to you, well, what colour shall I, you know, Gemma, what colour do you want over here? Or you sort of know that you're in the kind of murky, bluey greys over there or mm -hmm. you're in the kind of, plummy reds and, and it kind of on um, the whole that that was what was really exciting about the project mm. and and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to continue that through this year that um it has such a strong voice the voice mm. is kind of really um it, it, i think for michelle and myself it spoke to us both very clearly and we sort of followed that voice along together with all these fabulous actors and kind of came up with what you see, and, and as I said earlier, I'm really, really proud of what, what we've put together. <laughs> do you think, do you know what I mean, Michelle? Yeah, I do. I mean, as I suppose I joined later because I wasn't available when it started. I remember Gemma calling me and saying, oh, this sounds really good script. And I thought, oh, I can't do it. But, so it was quite exciting to come along and then join. And I agree. Yeah. And what I really loved about it was the diversity of the women. That, you know, it wasn't all middle class or upper class or poor women. Yeah. There were women from everywhere. And, yeah. and so that made it exciting. So, you know, someone like Bonfire, you know, I could take something from her heritage and the, the way she tied her scarf, but then I could take something that, you know, she stole a, boil, a bowler hat. She took a Hasidic Jewish man's coat and, tied, and she created the style herself. So that was, that was so exciting. I mean, and then you have the enormous primrose, you know, who dresses like a child. Of course, she is a child. And then you have... You have, um, I don't know who else you have, you have Amalia, and then you have Lavinia, which was just this amazing vehicle to do some such really beautifully constructed pieces because she's so still and doesn't move. And so you have this chance to think about how someone, how someone would dress like that. And her character, you know, so she can be in a room with someone like Amalia, and then you have, I guess, Hugo, and then and they're all so diverse, yet somehow they make up this funny sort of hodgepodge group of people that we know. And I and so I think it was yeah it was the diversity and the width and breadth of the cast and their background and their situations and where we could take that and as and I have to say with Gemma I I always start with color and fabrics I mean that's my key as soon as I go in I start dyeing and then it's almost it gives me a language to talk to Gemma as well when I first go there and I go to the office and well I don't know what you're thinking about this room but I and you go, I'm thinking Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah. and I, get, I think this, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's fascinating how it comes together. I mean, the tea room, I have to say, is still one of my oh. favourite yes. things ever. Oh. There was something yeah. so beautiful about it. And, the, and actually the asylum, I thought, was rather gorgeous as well. But it's that, there are these oh, wonderful yeah. worlds. Oh, and actually, sorry, the, uh, the, um, the butcher's mother's house. I mean, I wanted to just go and stay in there forever. It was just so perfect. I and I get so, so much from that. Yeah, I think the, the diversity of, of the demand of it all was absolutely, you know, we were going from gorgeous palatial homes to yeah. the butcher's mother, you know. So we I went know. to a single plane, which was 
that is a gorgeous part of it. I mean, totally. Yeah. And then in episode six, you go like futurist, and it's like, wow. I mean, that. I mean, I, I, I've never been on a show where I've actually actually had to design futuristic suits. You know, like sorry, space suits, whatever, or military yeah. suits, and and. And Victorian, and I think that is such a challenge and so exciting. And to think how to do that, and I know it was quite, it was quite difficult to it was shift difficult. your mind into that, really. But we both um, quite an effort, didn't we? Because sort of it yeah. could go many different ways, but nothing seemed quite right. And I think we did finally end up in the right, the right. You know, we have to believe that. You know, but yeah. um, I was really excited by it in the end. I actually thought I was. I thought it was great, and it was exactly how I imagined that. You know, turning. I mean, I watched the episodes, and I. It gets six. I went. I've got it. Seems like, like no, it's the wrong channel. What am I doing? This is insane. What? What? Where? Where have the nevers gone? And it was really that shocking. I loved it. And then actually, I have to say, six is one of my favourite because it just picks into all the different worlds. You know, there's a beautiful little bit of early period, a little bit earlier than the main story. Um, I just, I don't know. I just thought it was a really wonderful episode. Actually, I really enjoyed it. It suddenly starts making a bit of sense, yeah. and I found the whole pro. I mean, the whole series much more emotional than I thought I would yeah. than I would find it I was really quite moved at times and yeah when she, she died I was like quite upset yeah. <laughs> it's no, like, and I can't so, with her when they were talking oh. you know he and he he was sort of he was very moved she was very and I was good <laughs> really really <laughs> moved. you know it's just it's beautiful and and you know yeah. Hugo's character you can see that there's a softy in there as well as all exactly this. which I can't wait to bring out actually have to say yeah. in the next ones and all of these characters you start investing in them I love Frank I think some of the Frank and Hugo scenes together are some of my favorite pieces and again yeah. so different and then you get Malady, you know, gosh, no, yes, in the right. middle of all, <laughs> I how could I forget Malady? So, yeah, it was it was a really quite eventful thing to work on. I, just, yeah. I never really knew quite what would where I'd go next, but yeah. I just sort of held to the mast and see where. I'd <laughs> <pitch me next. laughs> and that's why I think it probably is successful because there's so much for an audience to sort of mm. when they think they're on one journey suddenly there's another journey to go off on and suddenly they're yeah. in a kind of you know a, a wild club and suddenly or they're in a padded cell I mean there's, it's, mm. there's so much diversity of where everybody finds themselves or underground with a galancy <laughs> it's like it's yeah. like it is it is quite true. but I think if we had tried to make it futuristic the costume and the sets or or somehow sci-fi-ish it would have been awful. It would have lost. It would have lost its impact completely. Yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because you were both mentioning, you know, the class structure and and the difference in in characters and locations. Actually, Gemma, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how that really influenced a lot of the production design elements when you're looking at these different types of locations, down to detailing the type of fabric that you're hanging as curtains, the type of furniture that you're sourcing to really fill the rooms with. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we built a huge amount of that stuff. I mean, we built all the alleyways and uh, the whole when she goes with her loaves of bread every day. A lot of that was built. But anyway, mm -hmm. no, um, I think um, that that's what, again, makes the whole kind of kaleidoscope of the show is, is kind of thinking about all these different characters and what they're kind of, how much money they've got, what they earn, where do they do their shopping, where do they buy their mm -hmm. fabrics, you know, and um, how much has been collected up from previous, you know, the, the mother in that flat of old and smelly in her room, you know. So you want to want to feel sort of claustrophobic and that hasn't been cleaned and it's just like, you know, oh my God. And the doctor says she could live forever. Oh my heavens above. <laughs> Tuck yourself in the river, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm, um, you know, covering the whole gamut and then going to the Bidlow estate, which was in West Wickham, which is a fabulous, fabulous place, mm -hmm. and um be able to really create that kind of the rich had that gorgeous party with all the flowers and the food and money to object, you know. I mean, that was just heaven to do to do mm -hmm. all that. And then go back to their rather sort of rather less opulent environment back in the back in the um in the orphanage. And then, you know, we also had wonderful things like the pump pumping station in um in uh in near Shepparton, which um gave extraordinary background for that whole set. You know, when you think they're all going, both going to be um, hung. I mean, it's absolutely shattering. So I think there was so much, um, all the different kind of classes, you know, you go, you give, it's just the textures that you give um, Hugo, I think his drawing room, 
I mean, in fact, there were paintings in there we painted specifically. You don't even see. There was so much to look at in there. And I think you get a fantastic sense of his flamboyance and who he is and where he comes from and what his kind of how much money he's got in his bank. He's a very comfortable individual, you know. Um, it's just, it gave you the opportunity, it gave us the opportunity, those scripts, just to go to so many different places and tell so many different stories. I think we mm. were... You know, I'm trying to think what else I particularly love. Actually, funnily enough, the um, hanging scene was wonderful because initially we were going to go and use a part of Greenwich. There's a whole sort of area there that's often shot in, which would have been absolutely fine. And then with the sort of whole arrival of COVID, etc., they sort of said, what do you think? Could you build it? And it was such a pleasure to do that. And mm -hmm. I based it on Strange Ways Prison, which is in Manchester, and absolutely of that period. And so, which is a huge thing, which is built, with all these wings going out. So we were just like in one aspect of those wings. And so you've got a really strong sense, I think, of kind of like more down part of, of, of the world where, you know, there was poverty, there was sort of penny rooms going on in those little houses around it. So um, I think that was, I, that was really unpleasant, enjoyable thing to, to create, you know. Yeah. I loved that balcony that you created for, for the um, hanging. Yeah. It was amazing. They all filed out on and then Hugo jumps off at the side. Yes, it was so good. good. And then he wanted yeah. to jump down into there and we gave him a, a cap and just yeah. sort of softened his whole look so he wanted to sort of jump down with the others. But yeah. yeah. It, was, it was quite touching, actually, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah I thought he was. I mean, I think that's it. I wanted to start softening his character. I want to understand the relationship between him and um, Frank and how it worked. And as yeah. you say, there's a softness to Hugo, which is all covered in all this sort of blather and whatever, and you yeah. know. But there's yeah. something in him, and I want just to start bringing that out. So I'm quite excited about sort of starting to do that. I think trying to, yeah, yeah, I think just trying to find those characters more. And I loved actually the dialogue scenes where you got to know about a, a little bit more about them. And I just, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm quite looking forward to finding him a bit further. Well, I, I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, quite agree. Mm -hmm. Quite agree. Well, I, it's been so thrilling to look at all of the details that you've managed to pull into this show. It's really phenomenal what you've both accomplished. And, and I love your dynamic and the way that you've worked and collaborated together as well. And can't wait to watch the, the second half of the season when we get to it. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.